the word. I will have you out by 8 o'clock, I promise you. So tonight we're talking about how to profit from God's word. And before we begin, let's just say a quick prayer. And let's begin our study. Father, we just thank you tonight, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for bringing us here again, gathering us. Lord, we just ask tonight that you would watch over your word, Lord, that you would just be our guide, be our teacher. Father, I just pray that you would just minister through me. Lord, I ask that you would grant me utterance tonight, Lord, to speak your word, to speak truth, to speak words of life. Lord, I pray that we would not leave here the same, that we would go out of here changed and transformed and touched by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, I just ask that you would anoint me, anoint my words. Lord, I pray that you would anoint our ears, Lord. Give us ears to hear in this room, Lord. Give us eyes to see and hearts to understand. Lord, give us revelation tonight. Open us the treasures of your word tonight. Lord, we just will give you all the glory for us and be our teacher, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. So tonight, in our study of growing up spiritually, we are going to be talking about how to profit from the Word, and then next week I'll be, bring, be moving on into a new lesson, a new topic altogether in growing up spiritually, but how to profit from the Word, and that's a question, and when we talk about how to profit from the Word, we're not talking about necessarily uh, prosperity in the sense of finances. Because when you hear that term, how to profit from the word, it sounds like, well, you know, you sound like you're selling a, a cheap gospel of how to profit. You know, I'm going to profit. How do I financially profit from God's word? Of course, we do believe in prosperity. We do believe there is a biblical prosperity. But we're not just talking about how to profit financially. The things of God, the spiritual matters, are, go much deeper and much, they go, they go much deeper than just finances. This goes into every realm of your life in terms of learning how to profit from God's word. In other words, we could just say, we could ask, how do we benefit from God's word? That's just another way of putting it. But God's word goes much deeper than just finances. It delves into topics of salvation. It delves into the topic of re redemption, righteousness, of faith, brotherly love, communion, companionship. It delves into the topics of judgment, eschatology, the study of end time events. So, but it's our instruction manual, and it teaches us how to live here on this earth. And so what we want to do is we want to know, and we want to learn, and we want to discover how does God's word, how can we apply God's word in our life so that we maximize the potential or the full capacity of what's in God's word? How do we profit the most out of the word of God? Because the things of God, my friends, they don't just fall on you like ripe cherries off of a tree. You have to go and you have to get it. The kingdom of God suffers violence, but the violent take it by force. So it's through an intentional act of your will that you profit from God's word. If you just let God's word just sit there and do nothing with it, it will have no benefit, it will have no bearing in your life whatsoever. So there is something that we have to do. There's a God side to this and there's a we side to it. So your side is to open your ears and receive what God has for you and what he wants to say to you. And that's something you have to practice on a daily basis. It's not something that you just do one time. You don't just do it on Sundays. You don't just do it whenever you feel like it. It's something you have to practice on a daily basis to intentionally receive what God's word is saying to you and what he wants to say to you. And you do that by coming to church, but you also do it by having your own devotional time, your time spent with Him, time in the Word, time in prayer, time just meditating on Scripture, studying the Scriptures, reading the Scriptures, just making time to spend in that Word and just fellowshipping with Him. And I, and I realize we're just talking about one side of this. Now, this is one side of the coin. I mean, we haven't even touched on prayer, so that's a whole other series altogether on prayer. So as much time as I spend in the Word, maybe as much time that I will give to prayer as well. Or maybe I might get more time to more than one the other, but that's okay as long as you, you are doing your part. And we want to do our part, and I believe that when we do our part, God does His part. So I've said it for years, and I will continue to say it, that the only part of God's Word that will profit you is the part that you get on the inside of you. That you get from your head down into your heart, into your soul. 
So we want to be good stewards of what he has given us, and we will be held accountable for the knowledge that we possess, the knowledge that we have. So you're not, God doesn't hold you accountable for the knowledge that you do not possess. He holds you accountable for the knowledge that you do possess. And so whatever God has spoken to you about or is speaking to you in your life, you need to be obedient to that because God will not give you any more revelation than the revelation that you are currently acting upon and currently living out in your own personal life. So if you have gotten to a place in your life where you're wondering, God, why aren't you speaking to me? What is happening? Everything's good. I feel like I'm in a stalemate. Go back to the last thing that he told you to do. As my old pastor used to say, put the car in reverse and go back to the last thing that he told you to do. So, and then make that turn and go in that direction. So if you're going in the wrong direction, just turn the car around and get back on the other track and get in the right direction where he wants you to be. So we're looking at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. <clears throat> and this is how to profit from God's word. Let's actually read verse 1. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those that heard it. Let me just read verse 2 again. For unto us was the gospel, or good news, was preached, as well as unto them, meaning the children of Israel, or Israel. But the word preached did not profit them, because it was not mixed with faith in those that heard it. If you're reading, I believe you, if you're reading a newer translation, such as the NIV, the 2011 version, it actually, I believe it says, it talks about uh, sharing in your faith that the word did not profit them because they did not share their faith. It's not actually, I don't think that's a very good translation or a very accurate translation. I think a better translation is the King James reading on this, which is that the word, the message that was preached to Israel, basically did not profit them because they did not mix it with faith. They did not... They did not, and when I think about mixing, I always think about, you know, some kind of chef that's just kind of mixing the bowl, if you will, just kind of putting different ingredients together inside of that. So they heard the word, but they did not mix their faith with it. They did not add their faith to it. And that's what God is saying to you and I, that if you want to profit from my, from my word, then you're going to have to do something. You're, you're going to have to mix your faith with his word. And you're going to have to be proactive about it. So, but Israel did not do that. And I want to take our time tonight, and I want to look at that a little bit. So when he talks about the good news, the, the message that was preached unto them, he said, well, what message was preached unto them? Well, for that, my friends, we're going to have to go back to the Old Testament. We're going to have to go back into the book of, we're going to look at Numbers 13 tonight, and we're going to look at God's promise to Israel and him trying or attempting to bring them into the promised land. Because the good news to Israel at that time was that God had a land that he wanted to give Israel. He wanted to bring them into a promised haven, a land that flows with milk and honey. That was the Canaan land. That was, that was God's promise basically through Abraham that God was going to raise up a seed out of the loins of Abraham that would basically multiply as the stars in heaven and that he would bring these, this people and would bring them into their own place, into their own land. And that was the promise. That was the good news. And so we're going to kind of go on a little journey. But what I want to ultimately do with you tonight is I want to just kind of show you and pull out some of the biblical principles in God's attempt to try to get them into the land to see where they went wrong and see and what can we do to not make those same mistakes. Because ultimately... The scripture here is, it's, it's clear, but it's black and white. They didn't profit because they didn't mix faith with the word. I mean, that's the, the fundamental common denominator as to why. But we're going to look at some principles in scripture, and let's see what scripture has to say about this topic. So just for a moment, so that we can kind of build up a, a little bit of a background here. Um, if we go back to the Old Testament, you know, the, the promised land that God gave them. Actually, let's, let's go to Genesis chapter 12 real quick. We'll just take a little journey a little walk through the scriptures. Genesis chapter 12. When God called Abraham, 
as <clears throat> when he called Abraham, his name actually was Abram, which means exalted father or exalted ruler. And it says in Genesis chapter 12, and this is a very interesting part of history because it's right here in Genesis chapter 12 that God actually begins to deal thoroughly or more thoroughly with the sin problem. Because if you go back to Genesis chapter 3, we see that the serpent beguiled Eve and Adam and they both fell. And then you go further into Noah's flood and God is still dealing with the wickedness of man and sin. And then you get up over into the Tower of Babel. There, there's still wickedness and sin and everybody's trying to, 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 you know, to, to be God, if you will. And God comes down and he confounds their language. But it's, so he's dealing with sin from like Genesis chapter 3 all the way through to 11, to the Tower of Babel. But when we get into chapter 12... God says, okay, I've had enough. I'm going to do something. I'm going to call this man Abraham, and I'm going to use him. And I'm going to create a nation out of this man. And out of his loins will come this nation. And I'm going to use this nation basically to bring redemption. And through that nation will come one person, a seed, a particular seed, and his name is Jesus, the Messiah, who will come and redeem all of humanity. And that was God's plan. That was God's plan of redemption. So he calls Abraham, but this is the, this is the, the blessing on Abraham and on his seed. He says, Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from your kindred and from your father's house unto a land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those that bless you and curse him that curses you. And in you all families of the earth shall be blessed. So the original promise to Abraham was that he would raise up a seed out of him, that he would call him, and he would make him a blessing. That he would be a blessing, and anybody who curses him, he would curse, and anybody who he blesses would be a blessing. So you and I now, I'm kind of jumping a little bit, you and I are recipients of that blessing because we come through the seed, the one seed, Jesus. And if we are Abraham's seed, then we are heirs according to the promise. We are inheritors of this promise. So we actually receive the promised blessing. So you, as a believer, if you're in Christ, you are the seed, you know, of Christ. Jesus is the seed. We are the, the offspring of Christ. Jesus is blessed, and because he's blessed, you and I are blessed. All because of this promise that God made to Abraham. So if you go forward into Genesis chapter 15, and we just take a, a quick look, I won't go into too much detail on Genesis chapter 15. God makes a covenant with Abraham, and he makes a covenant with him, and he basically tells Abraham that in verse 5, he says, to, for him to look up and look toward the heaven and tell the stars if you were able to number them. And he said, unto him, so shall your seed be. And the Lord counted to him as righteousness. So here, we can actually see that the Lord was making a covenant with Abraham. I won't go into all the details here, but you can read it in Genesis chapter 15, because Abraham wanted to know, how am I going to know that I'm going to actually you know, have a son? How am I going to know that I'm going to be the heir, or how I'm going to have the seed? And, and God basically tells him to take a heifer, to take animals, divide them, and then he sees God, he sees footprints walking through this sacrifice, which basically to Abraham, it confirmed God's word that he was going to bring about the promise, the promised seed. And as far as Abraham was concerned, that was it. He believed God. I mean, you know, when, when he looked up and he saw the stars, that confirmed it for Abraham. That was it. And he said, so shall your seed be. And, then, and so he said, oh, wow, I mean, that's amazing. But then God confirmed it by making a covenant with him, dividing the animals. And I believe God's footprints were in, walked basically through, through that, through those, uh, through those carcasses, because the blood had spilled down, and then the Bible says that he saw, you know, a, a torch going through it. So, and that was God really making covenant with him. And when Abraham saw that, wow, God doesn't break his covenant. So, and he was, you know, this is a, a Middle Eastern man, they know what covenant is. You know, and I don't really know what covenant is, like they do, but they do. So, anyway, so the covenant that he made with him, that was it, was settled. Then if you go into chapter 17, we look at chapter 17 real briefly. I'm just walking you through this and we're going to get into this. I just want you to understand a little bit of this. 
And he says to this in verse, in chapter 6, I'm sorry, chapter 17, verse 6, is, he says, And I will make you exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of you. And kings shall come out of you, talking to Abraham. And I will establish my covenant between me and your seed, and after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto you and to your seed after you. And I will give unto you and to your seed after you the land wherein you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So the land that God wanted to give them, as you can see here, was to basically be, it was to be a land that would be flowing with milk and honey. It would be a fruitful land. It was to be Israel's dwelling place where their home would be. They would find rest and peace there. The, it would be a place of blessing, a place of refuge, protection, and also... When I say to be a blessing to the world, they were to be the people through whom Christ would ultimately come through, through the, the Messiah would come through. But they were to be the people that were to go to the other nations and say, look, you need to get right with God and submit yourself to him, and God will have a relationship with you. And but most of the times, wherever they went, chaos would break out, judgment would fall, because if there was... Disobedience, And a lot of these nations, they were so corrupt and so evil, God had to say, okay, wipe them out. And it's like, wow, I mean, wipe them out? Literally, yeah, wipe, wipe them out. Because if you mingle with them, they're going to destroy you. And they're going to destroy my plan and destroy the plan of redemption. So you've got to judge this. You've got to deal with this. And so that's what God would ultimately do. He would actually get them to go out and, you know, and do warfare. But his ultimate plan really was to, I believe, was to get, would have been to get these nations if they had submitted themselves to the God, and not their God, but to the God, they would have come in and they would have come under you know, submission to God. They would have had the blessing of Abraham on them. And so, but that didn't happen. So, so anyway, so the, the promised land, why am I going into all of this? Because the promised land for you and I, see the Old Testament functions in types and shadows. So the promised land for Israel was, a, was supposed to be a place of rest. And if we had time, we can go through Hebrews chapter 4 and you can see this. It was to be a, a place of blessing, a place of rest. In the New Testament, our promised land really is a type of salvation. It's a type of salvation. So in the New Testament, our promised land is a type of salvation. It's a type of deliverance, preservation, protection, provision, healing, soundness. And it is a type of the blessing. And we are called by God to enter into that promise. And that's why he says that the word, the gospel that was preached unto them, unto Israel, he says it did not profit them because they did not believe. They did not mix faith with it. And in the same way, if we don't mix faith with the, God's promises, if we don't mix faith with what his word says, his promises are not going to benefit us. His word will not benefit us. So in the Old Testament, just like they had a promised land, you and I have a promised land. And if we're not careful, we can miss out. Thankfully, we, when you accepted Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior, you entered into the promised land. You entered into that place of rest. But Israel failed. The first generation failed, not the second one. The second one entered in after they were 40 years and older, I mean, after 40 years of wandering in the desert, their children ended up going into that promised land, but not without faith. But that first generation, because they didn't believe God, and they got into doubt and unbelief, they failed to enter in. But I want to submit something to you. I want to, say, I want to just share this before we look at the study a little bit. That I would truly believe that many Christians are missing out on the blessings that God has in store for them because they don't recognize the promises that are available to them in their promised land. They miss out. And they have stopped at salvation in the sense of receiving Jesus as their Lord and as their Savior. They've stopped there, but they don't yet fully embrace Everything else that God has for them, such as what well, is on that board, provision, preservation, protection, healing, soundness, blessing, and so forth and so on. 
So salvation is the beginning of it. So when you take your first step into that promised land, you just stepped into salvation. But now there's so many more acres to, to survey and so many more acres to obtain, so much more that's there. But most Christians, you know, God says, I give you, I'm giving you 200 acres of my promised land. And most Christians are occupying maybe one acre and they've settled there. And yet, 199 acres have gone unexplored. And you're going to find acres of God's promised land in his word. And that's what, it's up to you and I to dig into that and to find out what God has said and what he has promised us. All the promises of God in him are yes and in him, amen. So tonight we're going to look at a little bit of Israel's journey and try to under, understand a little bit of, you know, how, how does this apply to us? What is the type and what is the shadow here? How does this really apply to you and I? And so let's take a look in Numbers chapter 13 because this story is really, really pivotal. Um, <clears throat> Numbers chapter 13, God here is trying to get his people into the promised land. A journey that should have taken no more than two weeks at best ends up taking them 40 years because of unbelief and sin. But primarily because of unbelief. And God says to these people, because of their unbelief, and because they complain to him, they end up complaining to him for about 40 days after, and this is, I'm kind of jumping ahead. He says, for every day that you complain will be a year wandering in the wilderness. So you complain to me for 40 days? Okay. Each day that you complain to me will be one, one year. And 40 years they wandered. He says, only those who are 20 years old and, and under, or 19 and under, I have to look at it again. Uh, the, your, meaning your children, who are 20 years and under, they're going to get in. So, they'll go in. And they did. And they went under Joshua. And Moses never even got to go in there. And that's a whole other story altogether. But this promised land was originally promised to them because of Abraham. What we just read before. All those scriptures on Abraham. God said, I'm going to bring you into a land. This is what God's trying to do. He's trying to get them into this land. And yet, they're disobedient. But So let's just kind of read through this a little bit and just kind of underscore some of the, the principles that are here and see how they apply to your life and my life. So let's look at Numbers 13, verse 1 and following. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Send thou men that they may search the land of promise, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their father shall you send a man, every one a ruler among them. And as I was looking at this, as I was, as I was reading through this, the Lord kind of just, as I was putting some of this together today, and, I, you know, the Lord just kind of spoke to my heart, and he just said that, you know, when Moses was giving these instructions to send men to search the land of Canaan, you know, God, what God was wanting to say, what I felt the, what I felt the Lord just kind of talking to me about today was that you need to search God's word. You know, this is his Canaan land. You need to search his promises. You need to find out what the land looks like. You need to see what's available to you in Christ. You need to see what God has wrought for you, what he has provided for you. And we've just looked at a, a slide there where you can see it there. You can see he's provided blessing. He's provided preservation. He's provided protection. He's provided soundness. He's provided healing. He's pro he provides provision. It's there. It's all in the Word. And there's more. Those are just some of the things that are part of the promise of the promised land that you and I are called to search and research. So God says, you know, to you, survey the land. In other words, survey his word. Search his word. Find out what he has said to you. Find out if it's a particular area that you're dealing with in your life. If it's something that you are wrestling with. Find out what does God's word say about that. What has he spoken to you about in that regard? If it's healing in your body, what does his word say about it? Don't just rely on your neighbor to pray for you in that area. Don't rely just on the pastor to pray for you. And of course, I'll pray for anything that moves. It doesn't matter. 
But find out from God for yourself. Search the scriptures. Research them. You know, the Bible says that my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. They're destroyed for a lack of knowledge. It, we, mo many Christians don't even know what's available to them. I think about that story about, I think his name was Timothy, Timothy Gray, and it happened in 2012. And they found his body in Wyoming. Basically, he died of hyperthermia. And it turned, he was a homeless man. And the guy dies. They find out later that he was the heir of, I think it was the heiress of, of New York City. I forgot her name. Hugh, Hugh Hitt Clark or something. Hugh Hitt Clark. And she was, she was worth over $300 million, and he was to inherit $19 million of that $300. $19 million. That, was, that belonged to him. And yet he dies under the railroad tracks of hypothermia, a homeless man. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because we, don't, we, because we fail to find out what God has said. And we rely on somebody else, or we rely on you know, just our own feelings, our own thoughts, or we rely on something that has no basis. And so God says, look, search. Search the land. Search the Canaan land. Search, search it out. See what's there. Search the promises, my friends. So, but I like this in verse 2. In verse, he says, Send men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel, of every tribe of their fathers. Look at that. He says, I'm giving the land to every tribe of their fathers. I'm not just giving it to one person. I'm giving the land to everybody. And my point in bringing this up is to say that, look, God is not partial. God is no respecter of persons. He doesn't just say, I'm going to bless Gordon, but not bless John. I'm going to bless Bob, but I'm not going to bless Rosa. He doesn't do that. No, he says to whosoever will, let him come. Thank God, salvation belongs to everybody. Salvation, it, you know, it belongs to everybody that will believe him. In the same fashion, healing belongs to you if we can believe him. God's provision for your life belongs to you, if you can believe him. God's protection belongs to you. Now, it's, again, the word, the message did not profit Israel because it was not mixed with faith in those who heard it. In the same way, this message will not profit you, healing will not profit you, provision will not profit you, protection will not profit you, unless we mix faith with the promises, with his word. But point in case, God is not partial. He doesn't say, I'm going to bless so-and-so more than sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so. So keep that in mind. Everybody is special in God's eyes. You are special. And God loves you as much as he loves the next person. But God is a respecter of faith. He respects faith. He is partial to faith. You go through the New Testament. I love when he was about to heal the blind man. He says, this is what Jesus says. He goes, do you believe I can do this? And he says, yes, Lord. And, it, you know, and he heals him. And over and over, you'll see, Jesus will say to somebody, your faith made you whole. He doesn't say, oh, my faith made you whole. No, he says, your faith made you whole. And you'll see that play out over and over and over. And we know there's one time where one guy cries out and says, help thou my unbelief. <laughs> because the guy said, you know, if you could do something for my, for my son, you know, he keeps falling into the fire, he's demon-possessed. And he says to Jesus, if you can do something, please do it. And Jesus is like, if I can do something. And he got upset. He said, this is a wicked and perverse generation. That's what he said. And then he saw the crowd rushing, and then Jesus just went and he healed him. But there was no, the, the faith, where was the faith? Where was it? So, you know, God, he wants us to believe him, but we've got to mix faith with him. We've got to exercise our faith. And when we get into walking in faith and how to walk by faith, we'll, we'll get into that at, at some point. So God is not partial. He, he, he does not show partiality except where faith is concerned. I mean, I, I was thinking about this, I, I mean, 
I don't, I don't want to, this is a very touchy subject, so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go too much into this. But I believe, and you can write a letter to me, or I'll, I'll just give it to Ken. <laughs> I just say, he, he, he told me to say it. No, I'm just kidding. But I believe that, I, I, I'm hesitant to say this, but there are, are sometimes, there are things that we don't, receive from the Lord because we're not believing Him. And there are things that happen to one person and we say, well, why didn't they receive from God? Whatever it is. But yet, so-and-so over here received. Maybe it was healing. Maybe it was provision. Whatever. Why did so-and-so go under but yet so-and-so went over? I bet you somewhere in there I could be wrong that if there was faith, and they were living right, and there wasn't anything, you know, to hold back the blessing of God. I bet you, you could, you could, you could narrow it down to somewhere, in, somewhere where faith is. I bet you, you can, you can bring it right down to that level. But you can never judge that. You can never say, well, because they believed and they didn't believe, so you're telling me, Pastor, because you know, Gordon believed and so-and-so didn't, Gordon got it, but they didn't, so now you, 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 you talk, you know, well, let me just say this. I don't know all the reasons why somebody does not receive from God. I don't, I don't have, but I can tell you this. I believe there are reasons, and I know I've, I've, we've talked about this before, but, you know, if, if somebody has a, a problem with sin in their life, be a reason. If somebody is in unbelief, it could be a reason. If somebody has is harboring unforgiveness in their life, it could be a reason. If somebody's operating just out of mental assent, but it's not really coming from their heart, it could be a reason why they don't receive. So, but you and I are not privy to that. You're not privileged to know that. You won't. You won't know that. Unless God reveals it to you. Most of the time he doesn't because it's none of your business. And, and if you see a brother or a sister who's struggling in their faith, don't content, condemn them. Come up alongside them and try to help them and encourage them. And don't, whatever you do, say, why don't you believe God? You know, what's wrong with you? Don't, you know, don't, don't do that. That's, that's not love. That's not compassion. Because the truth is, is you may go through something and you may not handle it all that well. Or as well as that person is handling it. You may handle it on a much lesser level than they are. And you don't want to you don't want to judge people because it's, it's, it's not right. And and I will and I, as as a, as your pastor I will tell you there were things in my life that I was believing God for and it didn't happen and I wonder God why? 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 Why why not that? Why not this? I think we all we've all been there. But I don't stop believing him. I continue to believe him. I continue to stand on his word. Because for every time that I didn't get it, I can name a hundred other times that I did get it. Or at least ten other times that I did receive from the Lord. And so, and I can tell you what I did in those situations where I felt I made the connection. I can, I can go back to, I'll just take healing. I don't know why I always take healing. But I, I think the Lord has healed me a number of times. But I, I, I'll just give you an example. I was... I, this is just, this is like a like a flu. I mean, you know, and it doesn't matter if it's Ebola or if it's the, a cold, because to God it's it's you know what is it to God? I mean, the Bible says that the nations are like a little you know like sand in a bucket. So I mean, to God it's it's nothing. But but I remember one time I, I was battling with I believe it was like a, it was flu symptoms I was battling with, and I was just believing God and I was standing on the Word and I'm I'm quoting Scripture. I'm, confessing by his stripes on you, and I was just getting sicker and sicker. And I was like, whoa, man, this is not good. So, you know, and I, I, I was very careful with what I would say. I, I didn't want to say anything that was contrary to Scripture, and um, not because it, I was denying reality. I just wanted to be scriptural. And I was, so I was confessing the word, and I'm, I'm telling the Lord, I believe I receive, I believe I receive. And, and I put on this pastor friend out in uh, Missouri, I was, lit, I was watching him on, 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 uh, on TV. And he just so happened to be talking about healing. 
And the more he talked about healing, man, it just, it would just, it just inspired me. And I just, and it was like my faith just came alive. I can't describe it. It wasn't something I did. I just, I just suddenly believed that God wanted to heal me. And I just said, Lord, I believe I received my healing. I went like that. And I'm not exaggerating. From that moment I said that, I started to, it was like a fresh wind just kind of came over me. And I, I, and I started to feel better and better me. And it just, from that moment to the next hour or two hours, I was just getting better and better and better and better. And by the end of the day, I was completely healed. And I was like, wow. And the Lord showed me the reason I did not receive my healing the first time. When I was confessing and I'm quoting, he said, because it was all mental ascent. It wasn't heart ascent. It wasn't coming from your heart. It was coming from out of your head. But when you made that connection with your heart, and your heart made that connection, and I didn't even have to do anything. I just, because why? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. So when I heard that word, it got in my heart. And I believed it. And then I and it was and then healing came. So that, that's I know this is getting a little deep and getting out there. And I know you know Brother Ken's about to write a letter to Pastor Kind, but you know no, I'm just kidding. So, but that's that's just you know I, I believe you know like Smith Wigglesworth used to say this. He used to say there's two kinds of faith. He said there's mental ascent faith and then there's heart faith. Mental ascent faith just says you know I agree with that mentally, but heart faith says you know. You know it inside here. It's like you know that you know that you know that you know. And your heart, you just believe that. And you don't have to struggle to believe. And you'll know at times when you're not making that connection. When you're not connecting. You know, if you find yourself trying to believe for something and you're struggling to believe and it's getting into desperation, you're probably not in faith. And you're just, and you're not seeing, and you know how you'll know? If you don't see any results, something's, something's amiss. Something's not right. And when I don't see results, that's where I go to God and I say, God, where am I missing it? Where am I making, where am I messing up here? What, what, am, I, what, what am I not doing? So, anyway, um, let's move on. Are you guys getting anything out of this? Is this helping you? So then from verse 3, Moses commands them to go into the, <clears throat> into the land of Canaan to spy out this land, sends 12 spies, and in verse 16 we pick up, he says, these are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Joshua the son of Nun, Joshua. And verse 17, and Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, get you up this way southward and go up into this mountain. And I just want to bring this out in the the Lord just kind of impressed this on my heart that when Moses sent them to spy out the land, God gave them specific directions and said, you go this way. You go, you go up this way and you spy out the land. Meaning that as you are searching God's word, as you are, as you are searching the promised land, as you're looking to see what God has said, let's say about a very specific topic, you need to be hearing from him. You need to be listening to him. Because not every scripture is going to apply to every single situation. Healing doesn't apply when I'm looking at verses of protection. You know, if I need to be healed, I don't need to be protected. If I, don't, if I, if I need protection from God, I don't need, I don't, I'm not looking for healing. So, you know, but what, what you're looking at, be listening to what the Spirit of God is saying to you in that moment. Be listening. Be listening for that word, for that revelation, for, you know, when I went through that situation where I was sick and I was listening, and as I was hearing that word, it was like life just came into me. And it was just like, wow. And it was, it became what you would call a rhema. It became a spoken word. And faith came. So when I had that rhema, I had that spoken word from God, it was like, it just, it just became alive. But before, I was mentally ascending. I was doing everything I needed to do. I was quoting scripture. I'm trying to believe. I'm, I'm doing my part or thinking I'm doing my part. And nothing's happening. And then finally, when I relaxed, and I said, okay, I'm just going to I'm gonna just put this on. I'm sick as a dog. I don't have any energy to read or anything. Like that, but I can hear. And thank God, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And I just put that on. And as I heard the word, 
God ministered that word to my heart, and it became life to me. And when it became life, that's when things started to happen. So everybody, even you, you look through those in the New Testament where Jesus healed certain people. You look through there, and when he would say, according to your faith, be it unto you, don't you think that they were really in faith? They really believed. You know why they believed? Because they had heard about it. Somebody sick, somebody paralyzed, hearing that there's a man down the street who's healing other paralytics and who's healing, you know, people with diseases. And you start hearing that, whoa, faith starts to come alive. And that's what happened. And then they would find Jesus and they'd get in the press and then they'd have the encounter. And Jesus would say, do you believe I'm able to do this? Or according to your faith, be it unto you. Look at the woman with the issue of blood. She didn't even ask Jesus to heal her. She snuck behind him and pulled, pulled it out of him. And Jesus didn't even know who it was who touched him. He's sitting there, who touched me? Who? Somebody touched me because I felt power go out of me. That's what he said, literally. And then when he finally saw her, what'd she say? You know, it was me, Lord. And she, and what did he say to her? Your faith made you whole. But she, she pulled it out of him. So, you know, God is a respecter of faith. I'll just say that. I'm, you know, so when we talk about the word, and we talk about profiting by the word, you've got to, it, it, the word will not profit us unless we mix it with faith. Real Bible faith comes out of the heart. It doesn't just, it doesn't come out of the head. Head knowledge is mental assent. But heart knowledge, that's where, that's what you want. Because that's, you know, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. What does he say? But with the heart, man believes. He never says, with the head, man believes. He says, with the heart, man believes unto salvation. He believes. The mouth, confession is made unto salvation. But with the heart, man believes unto man, righteousness. So, let's, let's move forward. So here, hearing from God is, is, is critical. And, I, I, and I, I'm just going to say this. I cannot overemphasize this enough about hearing from God because I know a lot of believers and I've been there and I just shared an experience with you but I know a lot of believers that have basically said this this you know this thing doesn't even work anymore they just they, they've given up I remember growing up and I if they're listening God bless their heart but growing up I had brothers in the Lord that I was very close to that we were, we were learning these things, you know, what I'm sharing with you, I was learning some of this stuff 20 years ago, thankfully. And, and there, was a, there was a point where some of them, I can even think of one in particular, came to me a year, maybe a few years later, and just said to me, he's like, he's like Rich, he's like, none of this stuff works. Because I've been trying it, I've been doing it, I've been, I've been you know, confessing, I've been believing, it, it just doesn't work. And I didn't really understand it. I just knew that, well, Lord, I mean, I have two options here. Either I'm going to believe what you said or I'm not. I mean, there's not really any other option that I have here. So, you know what? If I go under, I'm going under believing what you said. And I thank God I'm still here 43 years later, whatever it is. So, thank, thank God. But my point, in, my point in bringing that out is that what I have learned is it is critical when you are believing God to make sure that you are being led by the Spirit, that you're hearing from Him. That, and you'll know if you're hearing from Him while you're believing Him when there's a connection. When you know that 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 your nose knows, you know you're making a connection. Let me, let me share one more little short testimony. I, I've just been on this for a long time. I worked for a, um, I worked for a furniture store back when I was like 20, 21, 22, maybe. I was going to college, and I just needed a part-time job just for extra cash. And I was working for this store, and I basically my job was to help bring the furniture to people's cars, and you know they would buy the furniture, and I would just basically bring it out, just you know lift up a couch with one arm. No, I'm just kidding. So, but, but that's what I would do. I'd just help them get their furniture, furniture out. So, at that, around that time, 
I had developed a growth in the back of my throat. And it was like a little, something was growing back there. And I remember like, and it was kind of spooky because one day it was like this big and then the next day it's like that big and the next day it's like that big. And I was like, all right, this thing is not going away. We need to do something. And I'm like, Lord, we're, you know, what do we do? And uh, so I just acted on instinct on the way I was trained in scripture. And I'm always thinking, you know, well, Jesus, what did you say? What did you say about problems? Well, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says shall come to pass, he will have whatever he says. So I said, okay. I know scripture says, by his stripes I'm healed. I went through all of those scriptures of with his stripes we are healed, by his stripes we are healed, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. I went through all of that. I just I wrote, wrote them down, started just putting it in my heart, speaking it out my mouth, looking at this verse, Mark 11, 23, that it, whosoever shall say to this mountain, so I looked at the mountain as a problem. I said, okay, the mountain is a problem. This thing in my throat is a mountain as far as I'm concerned. And as I was going through all of this, I just, I just said, okay, I, I, I believe God is in this. I don't, you know, I, I don't know any other way to approach this. And so I started to speak to that growth in the back of my throat. God is my witness. I started to speak to it. I started to command it to, to go. And I said, you can't stay in my body. I, my faith had gotten so worked up over, and this was going on for, I would say, almost two months. It didn't get any bigger, but it was there. And I would, and I would be so tempted all the time just to open my mouth just to see if it was gone. And uh, sometimes I would. I'm not going to lie. But it was just there. And I would just, and I remember a friend of mine, I remember, and this is kind of, you may laugh at this, but I, we were talking about healing because he was believing God for something. And I said, yeah, I believe in God for this thing. I said, I said, you know what? His name was Eric. Actually, he was here. He was here at the, at the picnic. His name was Eric. Um, he came to visit. And this is like 20 years ago. And, he, and I said, Eric, I said, you see this thing? And I opened my mouth. I said, you see this thing in the back of my throat? I said, it's going to go. I said, you know why it's going to go? Because Jesus said, whosoever shall say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and doesn't doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass. I said, it's going to go, Eric. And I kept saying it to him. Do you know the next day I was in that store, I was vacuuming, and I said, I don't know what I, I must have said something like hallelujah or praise the Lord that it's closing, and that thing shot out of my mouth. <laughs> God, to God be the glory. And I was like, wow! I was like, it works! It really works! And it just, but, you know, and I never had that thing ever again. So, whatever it was, I don't know exactly what it was, but it was, something was growing back there, and I said, it don't belong here, it's got to go, I don't, I don't care. So, you know, if God ever, you know, if God ever speaks to you and says, speak to the mountain, and I've had him do that. I've, I've just, just, a, just three words, four words, speak to the mountain. Just speak to the mountain. Speak to it. I mean, you know, look, folks, I didn't write that. Jesus wrote that. He's the one who said that. He's the one who said, you know, speak to the mountain. And if you don't doubt, but believe that what you say, if you don't doubt, but believe in your heart that what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. So, now, I don't just go doing that to anybody, you know. You know, if I, if I have, a, 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 you know, a congregation member that I don't like, Rose, I just speak to the mountain. No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> I'm like, no, you don't do that. Um, but you know, just I just I'm introducing some of these things to you, and I, I know some of them may, may be news here. But it's God's word, and a lot of these things have have lied dormant for years in people's lives. And but it's real; it really does work. And I can go, I can give you, you know, other examples. And I'm sure as I'm here over the years, you'll hear more, many more. So now I, I do have one. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna close in a minute, but. Um, well, I'll, I'll leave that alone. So, anyway. So, <clears throat> let's, let's get ready to close. Basically, they go into the promised land, and what ends up happening here is they come back with a report. And, they, and the Bible says that they brought up an evil report of the land. Look, look at verse 28 after they came back after spying the land. It says, this is what they said, the 12 spies. 
except for Joshua and Caleb. This is what the tent said. Nevertheless, the people are strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites, and the Mosquito Bites, and, the, and they dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. So all these heights. I mean, this is just problem after problem. That's all that they see. And but look at what Caleb says. He says, he, he stills the people before Moses and says, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But all of them, they say in verse 31, that they said, We're not able to go up against these people. They're too strong for us. And verse 32, and the Bible says, And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land for which we have gone to search it, it is a land that eats up the inhabitants. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. But look at, look at my screen up there where he talks about giants in the land. You'll notice verse 32 says that they brought up an evil report. And then look at the next, in that same verse, uh, of the same chapter, verse 32 and verse 33, it twice they use the words what they saw and also sight. Just four times they talk about, in two verses, the word sight or saw is mentioned. These people had their mind, had their eyes on what they could see, and they brought that report back. Instead of believing what God had told them, sorry, I'm spitting. Instead of believing what God had told them, they got caught up on what they could see. And it was overwhelming because there were just giants in the land. And that was the evil report that they brought up. And my friends, I'm, going to, I'm closing on this note. Look, there are giants in the land. There are giants in your life. And if you get caught up on what you can see more than what God has said, it, the land will devour you. The giants will devour you. Sickness and disease will devour you. It's a giant. Debt is a giant. Lack. Poverty. Those are giants in our land. Bondage. Giving into sin and temptation. That's a giant. But look at Caleb. Look what he says. He says, let us go up at once. Verse 30. Let us go up at once and possess it. For we are well able to overcome it. That's faith speaking. He obviously heard what Moses had said. He mixed faith. And fortunately, Joshua, Caleb and Joshua both entered the promised land 40 years later, though. But they got in. But that's faith. And so I just want to encourage you. Look, there are going to be giants in your life. You're going to face them. You're going to face them in your business. You're going to face them in your family. But greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And God is faithful and God is true. And I don't know how I'm, you know, I don't know how I'm going to react to every single situation that comes up in my life. I don't know. I have failed. I may fail you. But I'm not going to stop trying. I'm not going to stop believing God. I'm not going to stop, you know, doing what I know to do. And I'm, I'm following the results, you know, the results that God has given me the successes that he's given me in my past experiences, I mean, I, I, I pull on those. And I'm not going to share any more stories, but I mean, I can go back to story after story and show you and just go from one to the next, one to the next, and just show you how God delivered me in that situation and what role I had. Very few times have I ever had God just supernaturally intervene. But, I, but, but they have happened. When my faith was failing and everything was just falling apart and God just supernaturally picked me up. He, he pulled a Peter on me. Peter was sinking, but Jesus caught him. Isn't that awesome? Though your faith failed, he is faithful. So God is good. So praise God. Just stand to your feet. Let's, let's, let's close. I don't want to keep you too long. So I already have it on here. So the right attitude, Joshua, we don't have time to look at it, but if you go to chapter 14, verse 30, it says that, they, that Caleb had a different spirit. <laughs> chapter 14 and 23, he had a different spirit. 
What do you mean a different spirit? He had, or another spirit, it says. He had a spirit of faith. He had a, a spirit that was believing God. Not a, I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit. That's a, when the Bible talks about he had a different spirit, it means that he had a different attitude, is what he's saying. So you have the choices before you. Will you believe God? Or will you believe the giants that you see in the land? Don't deny the, the reality that there are giants. Don't deny that there are problems. Yes, there are. I'm not denying their reality. But I'm denying their reality to destroy my life. I'm denying their reality to stay in my life. But they're, they're going to be there. And we're going to have to battle giants for the rest of our lives. But if we have each other, and if my faith is weak, Rosa, you can join faith with me and lift me up that way. If your faith is weak, I'll join faith with you. And that's why we have what's called the body of Christ. Well, because we can't do it on our own. We're going to need each other to get through this. And so when you're struggling through something, you know, you're failing through something, I'm going to stand with you. And you should stand with one another. And we're going to pray for you. And we're going to believe God together with you. So if we have to carry you, you ever see those army movies where the guy gets shot and then they're both two guys are carrying him, you know, and then carry him to safety? Well, that's what we do with one another. We don't just leave you there. We want to carry you and carry you and carry each other, you know, to, and, and finish our course together. Amen? Amen. So praise God. Let me pray for you. Father, we just thank you tonight. Lord, I just ask that you will bless your people tonight. Father, I ask that you would make your face shine upon them, that you would lift up your countenance upon them, that you would grant them peace, Lord. Lord, I ask that everything that they put their hands to do, Lord, that you would prosper them, that you would protect them, that you would keep them, that you would bless them. And Lord, I pray that you would make them a blessing. And Lord, I pray that you would use everybody in this room, Lord, to minister salvation to somebody else, Lord. And Lord, we just give you all the glory and we give you all the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, thank you, everybody, for coming out. And uh, I trust you got something out of that. <coughs> Amen.